jump through chapter one here. Uh, before I do anything, I'm going to start making excuses. Um, you'll hear the phrase, Bungie, Bungie's State Trap, <laughs> several times. And I'll either say Bungie, like I just did, or Snake, <laughs> or Scrap. <laughs> and that miscue and any others I'm blaming because I have a little mouth guard that's holding a busted bridge today. Oh, no. and that's my excuse. <laughs> I can make all the mistakes I want. <laughs> Chapter 1. These are the days that must happen to you. Walt Whitman von Funk abruptly stopped reading his namesake's Song of Myself. He removed his glasses, flipped his blonde hair out of his eyes, and rubbed the bridge of his nose. Whitman helped him through troubling times. The latest assassination proved to be one of those times. He read the section once more. Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters of books. You shall not look through the, my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. Well, Walt had read the poem dozens of times before, but it hit him now. But now it hit him. I must be involved, he thought and no longer take things second and third hand. Walt considered his next step, barely sleeping that night as he mulled it over, waking in the morning and writing his parents that he would be staying at Oberlin College to help teach summer school classes. It hurt to lie to them. Walt then took the next Cleveland bus and walked resolutely into an Army induction center. It was June 8, 1968. Bad news? Dr. Seamus von Funk asked his wife. They'd run into each other beneath the crab apple trees beneath the office cabin at Sydney's Sanctum for the trouble. A one-time home and clinic for unwed mothers and victims of abuse. The 60s had erased any stigma for having babies out of wedlock, and the bulk of their workload had been turned over to the treatment center across the two main highways. Nurse Donna finished up the letter from her son, well, yeah, Walt's not coming home this summer, teaching a something. He doesn't really say much. She blew aside a shock of blonde hair that had fallen across her eyes and looked up at her husband, a good head taller than she, the blonde in his hair had gone a gray white. That's odd, Seamus said. He usually goes on and on about his schoolwork. At this time, Donna handed him the letter. Maybe you can read between the lines. Seamus could not. Curious, Seamus folded the letter. He didn't even mention Bobby Kennedy's assassination. What do you mean you're joining the army? Veronica, Walt's girlfriend, screamed with her blouse off and jeans half unbuttoned. She took a pull off her cigarette, its red glow slightly brighter than the tint of her hair. She had convinced a doctor that, with her mention, for her menstrual cycle's sake, she needed a birth control pill prescription, despite not being married. They were about to again take full advantage. I need to know what it's all about, Walt explained while pulling off one pant leg and then the other. How else can I even think about writing about it? He set his glasses on the dorm room desk. That's all you ever do is think about writing. You've never written a poem in your life. All you do is study goddamn poets. She had him there. Walt knew this, but couldn't take, shake the need to have everything just right for that first poem. Everything had to be perfect. A poem had to be perfect. Like Whitman, like Dickinson, like Eliot. Walt Whitman called it simmering, simmering, Walt replied, content to simmer till he found his muse. Whitman Schmidtman, Veronica went on the whiteness of her skin almost blinding. Is it Bobby's assassination? That put you over the edge? I mean, we just marched in another protest of the damn about. 
and now you volunteer for the same damn war? We were chanting, one, two, three, what are we fighting for? And now you want to join the fray. When I was just four or five, Walt recalled, I spied a photo on a bulletin board at the office at our clinic back home. A U.S. soldier lifting up the skirt of a Korean woman. On the back he'd written, jumping out of planes and chasing goop skirt. I had to ask Adam, an adult but still my friend, what goop meant. I guess I didn't like it because it stuck with me. Remember last month when we protested that Army induction center? The same one you just enlisted at? She snuffed out her cigarette and lit another. That's the one. Walt laid back on the bed, naked, failing to notice his girlfriend buttoning back up her shirt. Every other guy coming out of that place tried to antagonize us by yelling, gonna kill me some goops. The point of the sign was to show that these were human beings we were fighting for and against. Wanna be poet and soon to be warmonger, Veronica tucked in her blouse. Wanna be parrot, poet, Walt thought. Fair enough. He took notes on everything he saw from a young age, but never fashioned anything into verse. His notes usually led to doodling, and drawing fish or birds, nothing particularly good. He studied poetry because he was named Walt Whitman von Funk, and because he enjoyed it. As the door slammed shut, he took his erection in hand and masturbated to the vision of a Vietnamese woman whom he had never met rich color to her skin and kisses free of tar and nicotine. Waiting for a bus destined for the Ozarks, specifically Fort Leonard Wood near St. Robert, Missouri, Walt tried not to think much beyond the eight-week boot camp and the other eight weeks of combat medic training that lay ahead for him. He opened a book to a page dog-eared the night before, Walt Whitman's Song of the Open Road, in a passage he knew by heart. Listen, I will be honest with you. I do not offer old smooth prizes, but offer rough new prizes. These are the days that must happen to you. The black man, not much older than Walt, sat next to him on the bench. Earl's the name, he said, extending his hand. I had to quit graduate school to take over my daddy, well, my uncle's farm, and before I could fire up the tractor, here comes the draft notice. Walt shook his hand. No daddy, he asked, though he didn't even know the guy. Died in WW2, about the same time I was born. Hope it doesn't run in the family. Earl lit a cigarette. Germans or Japanese, Walt asked. American. Huh? Battle of Bamber Bridge. My uncle was there, too. <coughs> Tells me the story every year on the anniversary. They weren't segregated in Britain, but the U.S. Army brought Jim Crow along, and some white soldiers didn't like my daddy and his brother and other black soldiers drinking with white civilians, even though, even though the white civilians welcomed the black soldiers to their town. They taught the Brit girls how to jitterbug. That really pissed our white guys off. There's a George Orwell quote that I'll come up with in a minute. I left school, too, Walt added not wanting to exactly say he volunteered. Von Funk, Walt Von Funk. There was a playwright named Von Funk at Fisk University, a university in my freshman year. Wheelchair bound black guy, obviously no relation, Earl said with a chuckle. Walt wasn't sure if it was his first name or last. You obviously didn't know him well, Walt said. A black man, indeed, writes mostly about the black experience. And, actually, he is my brother, Frederick Douglass Van Fon Funk. How the hell did that happen? <coughs> Walt laughed, was about to begin the long story when a shadow fell on him. Wasn't there a German doctor and prisoner of war name of Von Funk? Another recruit asked, a lanky blonde fellow, waving Earl's smoke from his face. My pa was a guard at Fort Mad when he was held there. First German POW ever, Dad said. He said, all, all you lived in a commune. My name's Logan. That's my father, all right, Walt said. Most, more of an honorary title, though. 
We hadn't even entered the war, much less started taking prisoners. He escaped the Nazi army twice, then stowed away on the wrong ship, and they didn't know what to do with him when he got to America. Some Ohio congressman dubbed him a spy and locked him up, thinking it would further his career. He the one that raped his own daughter? Earl asked of the congressman. That's the only Ohio congressman we ever hear of. That's him, Walt muttered, recalling Tom Congressman Cash. Good riddance. How'd your daddy die, he asked Earl. Shot by an American MP. Died some time later. Any record of it was covered up. The U.S. Army demanded that the pubs ban colored soldiers. Instead, the owners put up black troops only signs on their doors. Fist fistfights started, white Americans against black Americans and Brits and civilians, then gunfire. Jesus, Walt muttered. Nice to know racism doesn't travel well. Years ago, we took a trip to your father's clinic on the Little Miami River, Logan said, apparently thinking the conversation had turned to travel. Walt suddenly recalled the Orwell quote and turned back to Earl. Orwell said of the Americans stationed in England something like, the only American soldiers with decent manners were the Negroes. Wait a minute, Logan interjected. Were you the weird kid always with a book under his arm? Guilty as charged, Walt replied, and wonder if he should go into the fact that his friend Harmon had ultimately married the cash daughter Cynthia a few years after she'd had her father's baby aborted at their clinic. My uncle said the Brits like to say of our soldiers, oversexed, overpaid, and over here. A smile raised one side of his thick mustache, and Earl easily hoisted a duffel onto his shoulder. I'm sure the Vietnamese are thrilled to have us, too, Walt smirked and lugged his suitcase. The big shots in the family, Walt went on as they moved to the bus, how come you couldn't swing a deferment? An officer began shouting out names, saving Walt from answering that question, for now. More questions came as the bus rolled south through Ohio, Walt pausing in mid-answer to one as he smelled root beer. Hey, Funky, ain't that your commune coming up? Logan pointed across Walt's face. Walt knew instantly that the nickname would stick, then spotted the huge sassafras tree that loomed over the office cabin at Sydney's sanctum, greeting visitors with that root beer scent. He hadn't even noticed the bus having turned off the main highway and taking the shortcut to Cincinnati that ran right by Sydney's sanctum. Walt slumped down. Are you on the lamb or something? Earl whispered over the back of his seat. He blew smoke out the window, which blew right back in through Walt's window and smacked into Logan's face. Nah, Walt straightened up as they rumbled by. Just haven't come clean with my parents. And may wonder how his parents would take the news. Let's see. Good God, Seamus, Donna called to her husband and held up a letter. From Walt. He's at Fort Leonard Wood in the Ozarks. Teaching poetry? Seamus <laughs> asked. In the army. Seamus grabbed the letter and read. I've spent the last two years at Oberlin protecting, protesting a war I know nothing about. Hemingway, Somerset Maugham, Gertrude Stein, not to mention Walt Whitman, they all immersed themselves in wars before writing on the subject, and certainly before condemning them as an unjust. I can't dismiss a duty, right or wrong, till I know if it's right or wrong. I can't make the decision based on secondhand information, on hearsay of a make love not war sign. I can't condemn it till I know. Seamus absently folded the letter. I just don't understand, he muttered. Last time he was home, we mapped out his deferments. Where did it all go wrong then? You insisted we name him goddamn Walt Whitman, Donna screamed right there in the middle of the Sydney Sanctum compound. That's where it all went wrong. You gave him that goddamn book he carried around his whole childhood about Whitman going off to the Civil War, wandering into battlefields to help the wounded. That's where it all went wrong. Surely you can't. I damn well can, Donna cried. Our baby's off to war. So that didn't go over too well, but basic training did. 
Well, Palgron with uh, Earl and Logan, for the most part, eagerly awaiting uh, the end and combat medic training. After it was over, he went back to Sydney Sanctum on leave and got a telegram saying that he was to report to Fort <coughs> Riley, Kansas for advanced infantry training. That didn't go over very well either. They tried and tried, but they couldn't get him back into the combat medic training. Walt survived and made his way all the way to Vietnam. Walt knew Billy Bremen vaguely during infantry training, but got to know him better on the plane over to Southeast Asia, as both were destined to report to the 4th Platoon Commander, Company C, ultimately replacing two dead soldiers that very first evening, as it turned out. They were joined by a wild-eyed Corporal Maynard, once a sergeant, now recovered for injury, who introduced himself as the rifleman. Walt was too intimidated to laugh. Big deal, Billy Bremen whispered. A Lieutenant Peters joined them, would be taking over command of the platoon. An air ambulance would deliver them to the jungle at first light, then evacuate, dust off, they said, an acronym foreign to Walt the dead body. The night before, they made it an, ex an explicit point of explaining the tunnels to Private Von Funk, or Funky, as his boot camp nickname had followed him to South Vietnam. They afraid you're about the right size, when a, Lieutenant Peters told him as he gauged the new arrivals, a hulking, sympathetic black man with worry and concern the only emotions on his face. Peters appeared to lo love his men and hate his job. Right or wrong, funky dude, little guys go down in the tunnels. No picnic down there. God awful holy terror is what it is. He went on to explain that some Viet Cong, Charlie, lived down there, but mostly they contained supplies. On, a, on occasion, intelligence could be gathered. Charlie don't normally guard the tunnels, Lieutenant went on, booby traps, they rely on them, punji stake traps, trip wire grenades, snakes and scorpions. Even if Lieutenant Peters hadn't gone into detail to explain the punji stake traps, Walt wouldn't have been able to sleep that night. If he slept, it resembled no sleep he'd slept before. Hmm. Conscious of dreaming, but unable to control the dream sweating like in a jungle, not in a dream, trembling from fears imagined, exhausted as if marching in his sleep, if he indeed slept at all, never closing his eyes, because closing his eyes meant brought thoughts of sharpened stakes impaling wherever they struck. Rousted from bed before the sun, tangled in sweat-soaked sheets like jungle vines, he limped as his left foot had certainly slept and slept on still that morning. The chopper blades created motion in the tall grass like waves heading out to sea, as opposed to welcoming them into the jungle. Bullets careened off the helicopter shell as they landed, continued overhead as they scrambled for cover. The platoon greeted the returning major, white guy and a little too proud of it, who introduced Billy and Funky. Walt heard snickers of tunnel rats and knew they were meant for him. They marched forever. They were off to a burned out village of Kin Bin toward the Laos border, 20 some kilometers northwest of Chao Lai Airfield in Cam Ki City. The oppressive October heat was nothing according to the, those veterans of the jungle. Five kilometers, someone said. A break meant sea rations and sweating bugs and mosquitoes. Time to do, what time do you suppose it is back home? Billy asked, but didn't wait for a response. Either morning or evening. Can't keep that straight. Either way, I'd be sweeping up the old man's store and thinking about sneaking off with Misty, my wife, at lunchtime or sneaking off with her at quitting time. Still have to sneak because we live with my folks. The sandy haired ex high school quarterback cracked a whistle of grin. Walt chuckled, thinking what a wonderful dilemma that'd be. If I was home, let's see, got no wife to sneak off with. 
So I probably probably be feeding some helpless alcoholic because his hands are shaking too bad to control a fork. Or worse, trying to console some teenage rape victim while waiting for a professional to take over. Any way you look at it, I'd be doing some good to someone, someone else, or at least trying, rather than sitting here wondering, will I have to kill someone or will they beat me to it? You know they're going to pick you to go down in the tunnel when you, you come across one, right? Brendan lowered his voice as they sat a few yards away from the others. I'm resigned to that, yes, Walt said. Don't it bother you? Brendan went on. Just because you're smaller than me, you get the shit job? It's my calling, I guess, Walt began with all the sarcasm he could muster. I suppose I was mistakenly given a rifle rather than a medical bag so I could explore these underground hideouts and no doubt change the course, if not the very outcome of the war. So it does bother you. It bothers the hell out of you, Walt muttered, as others gathered up their gear to move on. Taking up the rear of the squad, Walt's only job was to stay alert. Even with Maynard wielding his machete at the front of the line, Walt slapped the same low-hanging vine out of his way that Bremen in front of him had slapped away, then stumbled into Billy himself as the line stopped abruptly. Funky dude, baptism time, called out the lieutenant. Bummer, Billy murmured. This meant a tunnel, Walt knew. Maynard and two others prepared to go search for the other end. Walt longed for their smiling faces, faces should he make it through. He dreaded this so, it almost came as a relief to face it. Is this bravery? Being scared enough to rush in? Hustling up to the front of the line, Walt stripped off his pack, his M16 rifle and ammunition bandolier and wet jacket, glad to be rid of them. Glad for the M1911 pistol they handed him. Glad for the rope they tied around his waist. Glad this would be over one way or another. Give her two tugs every now and then, the lieutenant said, demonstrating that this stupid fucking private didn't know what two tugs were. Someone handed Walt a flashlight. The rustling in the weeds turned everyone's head, and Walt gave a smirk like maybe it was safer underground. Pray if you got him, the lieutenant said in summation. Prayer. The poem was the closest thing Walt knew to prayer. Therefore, Walt meant Whitman, the closest thing to God. Give me to warble spontaneous songs reclusive by myself, he quoted with a flair afforded a dying man's last words. Give me solitude, give me nature, give me again, O oh nature, your primal sanities. What the fuck was that? Mayor grumbled as he left to find the tunnel exit. They're all Charlie, Bremen whispered, reminding Walt that a pretty young girl cowering in a tunnel corner could have a pistol under her dress, or that old lady might just slit your throat. Nine-year Viet Cong soldiers were not uncommon. Walt nodded. He'd paid attention to all the tunnel lectures the night before. He knew they were meant for his ears. Private tunnel rat. Down he went. Crawling headfirst into the entrance, wet from the rain, then swallowed up by blackness before reaching a dry floor in a dank room. Adjusting to the darkness and the flashlight glow, Walt saw a straw mat on it a blanket. He tugged twice on the rope and crept further in, bolstered by the fact that nothing had happened, yet fearful that something might would. Down another level, around the corner, a faint lantern's glow slowly grew, revealing a girl, a young woman, wearing a U.S. Army issue armored vest and one of those cone-shaped straw hats. They're all Charlie. Walt couldn't bring himself to raise his pistol, felt the tug on the rope, gave two tugs back, <coughs> and reasoned he didn't have to put one between her eyes, that firing into the vest would stun her enough to give him the advantage but he still couldn't lift his weapon to even threaten. She had a thin face, cheekbones at sharp angles, and a tiny mouth with teeth that didn't quite seem to fit until she smiled. Unfazed, she showed off those teeth and said in a voice like music, Hello, 
You are the one. Do not be afraid. She spoke better English than most of the guys in squad 3, 4 platoon, company C, 3rd battalion, 35th infantry, 9th division of the United States Army. Walt smelled steaks on a grill. Curious. He eased his grip on the pistol and went to tug on the rope. It had been cut. Two tugs, she sang, still smiling, to someone behind Walt, just as the floor gave way beneath him. Down he tumbled. A snapping sound signaled the release of Punchy's steaks, sure to instantaneously drive into his skull, chest, or groin. No, his foot. Something had pierced his left foot. His war had ended, one way or another. About to lose consciousness, he heard the young woman's voice calling down from above, do not be afraid, you are the one. There you go. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? So I say what happens, but you're going to say by the book. You've <laughs> <laughs> seen me talk before. <laughs> I know to remember about the Vietnam War. Personally, did you have older siblings that had to deal with, uh, you know, draft notices or numbers or? You know, I was in the 1974 draft, and I believe number nine was the number that I got. Bill Phelps and I. I remember marching around school, you know, pretending to be soldiers, you know, because for all intents and purposes, it was over. It was just a formality. Mm -hmm. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, you know, one joker sinks the wrong boat or shoots the wrong guy. And so that's about as close as I got to the yeah. army. And what I read is all the war stuff in this book. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else even remotely has anything to do with the war. But there are celebrities. Richard Nixon followed shortly after his wall gets back mm -hmm. to the United States. John Prine, Graham Parson, Parsons, and Emmy Lou Harris do some benefit concerts. Walt meets John Prine on a flight back from Germany to the United States. And Joe Biden, well, he didn't fight in Vietnam. He was running for his first Senate seat in 72. And Donald Trump was in it too first case of housing discrimination. Yes? We will get an idea if you want to develop. Do you just start writing or do you plot it out and make a plan and put it on the wall? I make no plan. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of an outline I use a timeline. <laughs> you know, I mean, when this, when I was, my book, uh, The Cary Grant Sanatorium and Playhouse, Walt was born during that book in 1948. And I paused for a second after he was born that that poor sap's going to be draft age come Vietnam. And wow. the germ of that started working then. find different points in history that I want to touch on, different events, big time, or things I've never heard of. I'd rather find things I've never heard of, but, uh, after when I just wrote 
from point A to point B and wherever it takes me. And if it takes me somewhere where one of my other books was, I grab a character from there and put them in that book. Well, they work out for me. <laughs> I was going to ask you, why did you write this story? But, maybe, but based on that, maybe there isn't a why? Which one is it? Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, all the, I mean, the 60s were, and the early 70s were full of all kinds of juicy material, so. In going through it, you know, uh, well, the theme, you know, uh, the title, If I Lie in a Combat Zone, there's a, a marching ditty that they they do, If I Die in a Combat Zone, Pack Me Up and Ship Me Home. And so I took that and changed it to Lie because of all the lies that got us into Vietnam lies Walt had to tell and the lies that we'll subsequently find out were told about what he did in Vietnam to try to make him a hero. And so it's, it's about truth and lies. I think if it had to come down to a theme. How much of you is in you? Um, I'm a lot like Walt. Uh, most of my books, I'm pretty much the main character. Um, and certainly my feelings on the war and whatnot, all wars, are certainly part of it as well. You know, I became one. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I was researching the other book, you know, I was uh, his Walt's dad is imprisoned in this silly little fort, and he's a cook, so I mean, he was imprisoned in the kitchen, and there was a little library, and the only books worth reading were Walt Whitman books, so he devoured them. And that was how he learned what America was all about, what the Civil War was all about. And, but it's amazing. I would every time I got stumped, you know, like you know, the baby was being born. I would type in Walt Whitman on babies. You know, it would be a poem. <laughs> you know, Walt Whitman on war, like a million of them on war, because when it started. Civil War, with Walt Whitman on anything. It was just, it was a poem. <laughs> so so he, he covered it all, so he had a good read. So yes, now I am just Walt Whitman. And he's funny. There are some hilarious lines in it that I steal from him. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge poetry fan reading poets that I know, but uh, Walt Whitman is a lot of fun to read. And you must have a pretty strong interest in history, um, like were you a history major or anything like that? Because I like the way you're all your books kind of leave in a lot of... There's this thing called Google? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, now I got it. Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do enjoy researching history. It's, it's amazing to find you know, stuff that, you know, there's the Battle of Bamber Bridge. I mean, actually, that, I always get these Facebook things from different history places. I post them stumbling into them online. 
What's this whole story about you know, American MPs shooting black Americans? Because they were hanging out in a bar, they were welcome. <laughs> like, where, where is that in our history books? So yeah, I find it very interesting. It makes the whole process a lot of fun. So if it's historical fiction, fiction part of it are the people that you put in to your going back and learning about what happened with a gang violence or some kind of history. So you have all these characters that float in and out of history. And, I mean, because that's the genre, isn't it? Yeah. Historical fiction. So you need somebody to be the fiction part of it and the history part of it. <laughs> yeah. I like the meshing the real people with the phony ones. You know that there was still, you know, uh, I didn't pay much attention, you know, in the 70s to anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, it was all pretty much news to me that I and, uh, and again, the, I mean, we're learning things. that we went all the way back to Truman starting up the lies about why we needed to invade Vietnam to get the oil and their tin and, you know, and just the perpetuating of them all the way through. The guys you wouldn't think would be lying and, you know, and that happened to every war it turns out. Alright, shall we sign some books? Okay. I already signed them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>